All right. All right. All right. Good morning. God bless you. I'm glad to be in the service one more time. Hallelujah. Yes, you are absolutely right. Another packed house. Amen. 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 Stay at home because we don't have any more room. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the house is proud, and we're right. thankful to God uh, for those who came out uh, for this morning's uh, Bible study. We thank and praise God for those of you also who have tuned in online, looking at those of you who are here on uh, on uh, Facebook Live as well as YouTube Live, and I'm grateful uh, for each and every one of you who have taken the time uh, to come together for this uh, much needed and much necessary is that, does that make sense? Much necessary, yes. very necessary yes. uh, Bible study as we uh, attempt to uh, grow in the things of God, especially as it relates uh, to evangelism and living a life on mission. Listen, God requires of each and every one of us who have been saved uh, to go and fish for other lost sheep uh, that they may come into the fold of salvation as well. And so I'm excited about this series. We're starting on uh, chapter four, Kingdom Realignment. If there are those of you uh, who are watching online, if you'd like to get a copy of the outline, you can go to the church's website, parttakerscb.org, click on the services tab, and download a copy of the outline so that you can keep up with it. Amen. We're going to begin uh, this Bible study, let's have a word of prayer first. God, we thank you so much for all these people in the sanctuary. Amen. Oh, Amen. God, you just continue to Amen. add and fill it and to the overflow. And we thank you in advance yes, for those whose hearts are attentive towards the teachings that you have prepared for us. God, we thank you uh, for those who have tuned in uh, online, God, virtually, and we pray. Uh, that, God, you would give us clarity of speech and thought, that you would forgive us of our sins, create in us a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within us, that we can continue doing your holy and most righteous will. Prepare our hearts to receive. Breathe on us, God. Have your way in your place with your people for your glory. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, who is our strength, rock, and redeemer. And we are so grateful and thankful. Ignite in us the fire for evangelism and witnessing. Give us the words and the wherewithal and the will to reach out to those who may not know you in the free pardoning of their sins, to invite them into the eternal saving grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God bless Partakers Church as a whole. Continue to add, not just to the kingdom, but to this local assembly of believers. Then prepare us to receive and to train and to make disciples to go ye therefore. Your word reminds us that the harvest is right, but the laborers are few. And so we pray to the Lord of the harvest that you would send willing, working laborers to help advance your kingdom agenda. We thank you that you hear us when we pray, as we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let every heart say amen, amen, amen and amen. Listen, uh, we're starting off. This lesson begins. Uh, the first part is kingdom realignment. Why would it need realignment? Because obviously it's out of alignment. <laughs> if we're not uh, doing what God has charged us to do as it relates to letting others know about the benefits that they can receive in having a solid relationship with Jesus Christ. It, say, it tells us, uh, so God is on a mission to redeem and reconcile his people or to reconcile people to himself. This mission sweeps both history and the globe and it encompasses regular, ordinary people like you and me. Not just the ones who give sermons, but the ones who listen. Not just paid professionals, but average Joe and Josephinas working a nine to five job. Amen. 
<laughs> not just pastors and mission agency leaders, but businessmen and soccer moms. However, if you're honest, you may say that you don't feel much like you are a part of God's grand mission. After all, it's Wednesday. Hallelujah. Everyone despises Wednesday. Not only do you have to get the kids ready for school, you just realize you forgot to make their lunches last night. Now you're going to be late to your meeting and you have to figure out what you're going to tell your boss. After a crazy day at work, you somehow have to figure out how to get the kids to practice on time and you still don't know what you'll make for dinner. At this point, you're just hoping to get the day wrapped up in time to kick back and watch a little television later tonight. A missionary bearing the hope of the world is not exactly how you would describe yourself. Help us God. Maybe in theory, but in practice, on a random Wednesday, your mind is far from it. Why don't you embrace God's mission? Because frankly, we have our own mission. We have our own way of calling the shots. We decide what's meaningful or worthwhile and order our lives accordingly. Some people's life's mission is to pursue entertainment and comfort. For others, it's security and wealth. For others, it may be rising up the corporate ladder or being the most respected mom in the neighborhood. We like to be the boss of our own lives, don't we? Okay, amen. <laughs> This goes back to the sin of our first parents in the Garden of Eden. As we talked about earlier in a previous introduction, Adam and Eve chose to be king and queen of their own kingdom rather than joyfully submitting to the authority of God as king. We may read their story in Genesis chapter three, and I encourage you that in your time of study and personal meditation, that you would read that entire chapter read in their story and shake our heads. But the fact is that we have all done the exact same thing in one way or another. In light of this, it's not surprising that some of Jesus's first words in his earthly ministry, according to Matthew chapter four, verse 17, Hallelujah. this is what he said. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, <laughs> for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. That word stings our pride. But once we get past that, we realize it oozes with grace because it invites us into something better. Repent, because the kingdom already has a king. And you and I are not it. Amen. If we are ever going to get swept up into God's kingdom, we will have to let go of our own. Our own ways of seeing and approaching our lives will have to be radically reoriented. Thus, kingdom realignment. We have to get off the throne and put God back on the throne of our own personal lives. And that starts with point number two, the good news of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Let's talk about it. In 21st century United States, we don't exactly have the perfect context for king and kingdom language. We're not an empire, we're a democracy where decisions are made based on the majority of the people one way or the other. In large part, we are more familiar with democracy in which every voice counts equally. For the vast majority of people throughout history, however, the language of monarchy would ring with weight because it's exactly what they lived in. In their world, if a king decreed something, it happened. 
No questions asked. If the king wanted something to become law, guess what? It became law. There was no system of checks and balances to make sure the king didn't become a tyrant. The idea of living under a monarchy might seem unappealing because you know plenty of stories where power and authority corrupt and cause unthinkable damage. But the hesitation that arises when thinking about living under a solitary king or queen's rule lessens when you realize that the goodness or badness of living under such authority deepens entirely. And we mean 100% on the goodness or badness of the said king or queen. What would you think of living under a perfectly good, perfectly wise king whose every decision was for your benefit and eternal good? We can live with that kind of king, can't we? That may, in fact, not be so unappealing. Now, throughout his ministry, Jesus, his message resounded with the truth that his kingdom had come and that it was a kingdom of good news, not a kingdom of oppression or corruption. Who wouldn't want to live in that kingdom? When we look at Matthew chapter four, verse 23, this is what the Bible says, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Truly understanding this idea of good news begs some context. Historically, this is the context. During a time of war, kings would set off to battle for their people against the given enemy. If the king was defeated, his people would either become slaves to the enemy or be killed. Messengers would run back to the city yelling, run for your lives. However, when the king and his soldiers triumphed, he would send back a messenger to let the people know that the enemy had been defeated. The messenger would yell, good news, good news. This could have literally meant freedom from impending slavery or death. This news from the messenger is the same word we now use as the word gospel, which in its simplest form means good news. The message of King Jesus is the gospel. Our king has gone before us and defeated the enemy. Hallelujah. Therefore, imparting to us victory over the slavery of sin and death. This is no everyday good news. This is life altering good news. And we who have been reconciled to God have now been given the privilege of spreading this good news to a world that is in desperate need of it. The good news of the kingdom is that God doesn't leave us in a state of sinful devastation, but calls us to turn from our sin and to look to him for hope and restoration. For the remainder of this lesson, let's look at why the good news that Jesus is king of his kingdom. We do know that is good news, Amen. that he's the only king that we worship. Amen? Amen? Well, first of all, the good news is Jesus is on the throne. Amen. I would rather have no, I wouldn't want nobody else to be on the throne yes. but Jesus. He says, several years ago, I traveled to England for a conference where I took a day to see London. The last stop on my tour was at Buckingham Palace, home to Queen Elizabeth. The tour guide explained the traditional I'm sorry, the tradition behind the changing of the guards 
and many of the other historic symbols. One especially memorable remark was about the significance of the flag on top of the palace. The guide explained that when the queen is not in residence, the flag does not fly. Though the Queen of England does not have the official power over the people that she once held, there is still a strong sense of national pride and security in knowing that she is there. For the people of England, when the flag is flying, the people can be assured that the queen is on her throne. When looking at the decline and challenge facing the North American church, as we talked about in the last lesson last week, the task of the mission can seem daunting. However, we cannot allow any amount of hopelessness or despair to gain control over us. Why? Because the king is on his throne, reigning over his kingdom. Amen. From the beginning, God has reigned over the universe. We believe that, don't we? Amen. Regardless of what the world tells us, that one thing has not changed. He has always been the sovereign king of the cosmos with ultimate rule and ultimate reign, and he will continue to be nothing less. He is, as we shout on Sunday, king of kings on a mission. He reminds us that whenever we read Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, the Bible says, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The fact that God is on his throne and that Jesus is building his church should bring us great relief. We can rely or we can release any and all unnecessary pressure or worry that ministry may tempt us to carry and trust that God will accomplish what he has set out to do. I'm so glad I'm on his team. Good news, Jesus is still on the throne. The second part of that good news is Jesus is a different kind of king. Thank you, God. When you think about earthly kings and queens, odds are you may think about some far away, inaccessible royalty who is unable or simply uninterested to relate to his subject. You may think of an aloof and uncaring ruler who has only his best interests in mind. But Jesus is an altogether different kind of king. He took on the very plight of his subjects to provide a way out of the mess they had made for themselves. He is far from aloof. He is far from uncaring or inaccessible someone who does not meddle in the affairs of his people. Jesus is a king who got down into the mess of humanity, who went to ultimate lengths to seek and save the lost and restore people back to his kingdom. Jesus is the absolute best king imaginable Amen. because he is that perfect and wise and good king Thank you, God, who always works everything for the best for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Since Jesus is a different kind of king, we serve in a different kind of kingdom. Kingdom of God takes what culture tells us and turns it upside down. The more we grow in knowing this good king, the more the truths of an upside down kingdom become real. Take a look at these cultural norms and how they compare to God's kingdom. We've got a list of about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight or nine of them. But here's the first one. Culture says, the culture says, be first. Selfishness. The kingdom says the last will be first 
and the first shall be last. For many are called, but few are chosen. That's Matthew 20 and 16. Can you see the difference? The cult, what the culture says is step over others to exalt yourself. What God says is humble yourself to be exalted. We see that first of all in Matthew 23 and 12. It says, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, brought down. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. James chapter four, verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. First Peter five and six says, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So we got the difference between what the culture says and what God says. The, what the culture says or what culture says is do whatever makes you look best. <laughs> Even if it means crapping on other people. Yeah. But what God says is take the worst seat at the table instead of the best. Luke chapter 14, verses 8 through 10 says, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. Verse 9, And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. I learned this as a young preacher. If ever my pastor is invited and I'm going, and even as a preacher, I don't go sit in the pulpit. I don't care what the deacon say. Amen. Unless that pastor... And my pastor invite me to come. I sit my tail in the back because it's best to be ass up than to be told to sit there and get there. It can be embarrassing. I've seen it happen. And, I look, and after I finish laughing, I'm like, I'm so glad it ain't me. Amen. We try to exalt ourselves. Don't please don't let these titles go to your head. Amen. Amen. Titles do nothing but make us a bigger target. What the culture says is that your life is what's most important. What God says is consider others better than yourself. Philippians chapter two, verses three and four says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Got to be considerate and compassionate. What culture says is always get slash do what you want. Amen. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. Amen. It's your thing. That's what the culture says. Amen. God says, die to your own desires. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. That's hard to do. Do you not realize, Dr. Smith, that if more believers denied themselves, more people would be in church. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep it as simple. That there, there are those who are believers who don't come to church day or weekly, or monthly sometimes, maybe even yearly, because they care more about what's, what, what's important, to, what they want to do, yeah. as opposed to what God desires. Yeah. Even in partakers. I hope you're looking. 
<laughs> Amen. You don't come to church every Sunday because you don't want to. And, and we make justifications and excuses. And I like what uh, 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 Sister Dorothy Wilson taught in one of the Sunday schools. She says, excuses are only acceptable to the people who make them. <laughs> Amen. So we look at our own desires. Culture says, take care of yourself first and foremost. Speaking of, <laughs> hey man, look out for numero uno, look out for yourself. Number one, what God says is whoever loses his life, they'll find it. Matthew 16 and 25 says, for whoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. The culture says, maybe forgive, but don't you forget. <laughs> that, hey, amen. Uh, we, we park that sometimes. Let me not lie on y'all. I park that sometimes. <laughs> I forgive. I, I ain't forget. That's why God gave me a memory. Amen. But what God says, and this is, oh Lord, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Now that don't mean they got to be close. Amen. They ain't got to invite you over. You ever heard of love from a distance? Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This is what God says. Uh, <laughs> 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 Amen. The culture says something different. And depending on the situation, we lean more with the culture. But nevertheless, we need to know God's perspective and pray for the strength and will to actually do it because it can be tough. Amen. You don't go back to the person who injured you for healing. People get it twisted. You know, you can forgive a person and not fellowship with them, but that don't mean you mistreat them or dog them out. You pray for them. If they made themselves your enemy, God tells us what to do. And it's tough. Amen. But if it were easy, There'll be more people forgiven. There'll be more reconciliation. Amen. What the culture says, have nothing to do. That's my line there. <laughs> have nothing to do, Sister Pat, with those who are against you. <laughs> Sister Mobley, we can send them on down there with the devil. But look at what God says. God says this. God says, Bless those who persecute you. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. So, Sanji, you can't cuss them out. You got to say, God bless you and keep it going. Leave that to me and Sister Johnson. What the culture says, no one tells you what to do. You ain't the boss of me. What God says, go further than what you are asked. Matthew chapter 5, verse 41 says, And whoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, go with him two miles. That's the picture of sacrifice. The irony of the kingdom is that, number one, fulfillment is found in sacrifice. Number two, true identity is found as we lose ourselves in Christ. Number three, our deepest questions are answered outside of ourselves. It is truly a good kingdom with a good king with good news for a hurting world. We have good news of the kingdom, good news Jesus is on the throne, good news Jesus is a different kind of King and the next one is good news. The kingdom is all about not us. Mm. 
We can make it about us. Okay. Ooh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let that one soak in. <laughs> Look, I, I, I'm receiving my own conviction too. Cause God, do y'all take such good care of me? It's easy to get spoiled. <laughs> and I have to check myself sometime before I feel like asking for stuff. Because y'all do. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I never want to be one of those who take that for granted, granted, or abuse it. Because it's a privilege. And I have to believe that God puts it on your heart to do. I, I, I can't have nobody give me nothing next to Sister Glover because she's going to make me take it. <laughs> Don't but receive and learn, receive, learn how to receive. Because people being that good, you'll start thinking it's about you. Yeah. And you'll start making decisions based on your perspective alone, and you can shift so far away from God. This is why, you know, not thinking more of ourselves than we ought, being others focused. Amen. So it's all about Jesus. All that we do is as unto the Lord. The reason our personal kingdom feels so small is because, well, they are. No part of who we are is big enough to merit the weight and grandeur of a king because only one life is. The writer of Hebrews puts it like this in Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. This is what the Bible says. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. He says, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being in the brightness of his glory, in the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Here's an exercise for us. Answer the following questions based on the passage that we just read. I'm going to read them to you, and I'm going to read them slow. <laughs> Make sure we get it. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Number one, by whom has God spoken to us? How can they hear? So God speaks to us through preaching, through the word, through the Holy Spirit. So keep that in mind. Who is the heir of all things? Well, it says Jesus. Let's go back to the text. Uh, he, he has spoken to us by his son. Uh, that, that's the, the uh, question number one. God has appointed him heir of all things. Okay. So it all points to Jesus. Through whom did God make the universe? According to the text. And made the universe through him. Jesus. The answer is the same for each one of them. Let's give y'all a little cheat. Who is the radius of God's glory? Who is the exact expression of God's nature? Who sustains all things by his powerful word? who purifies us from all sin, who is seated at the right hand of majesty, who is ranked higher than the angels. If you grew up in and around the church, you know that the answer to all the questions are all the same and typically viewed as Sunday school answers. In other words, if you don't know the answer, while sitting in a building with stained glass windows, then simply say Jesus. 
and there is a good chance you'll answer the typical Sunday school question correctly. The answer really is that simple, through Jesus. The kingdom really is all about Jesus, about who he is, what he's done, and what he continues to do as king. Jesus is the one through whom God has spoken to all of humanity. Jesus is the king and heir with God the Father of all things. Jesus is the one through whom God the Father made the universe. Jesus is the exact expression of God's nature. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. Jesus, oh God, I'm getting happy, sustains all things by his powerful word. Jesus purifies us from all our sin. Jesus is seated on the throne at the right hand of the majesty. Jesus is not only the king, creator, sustainer, and brilliance of God's glory, but also the means by which sinful man can be made clean again. It's good news that the kingdom, that the kingdom is all about Jesus because worshiping him is what all of creation was designed for. Reflecting God's glory is the only thing that will ever truly satisfy and enliven not only us as humans, but the very grass, the oceans, the rocks, and trees that cover the earth. That's good news. That is always all about Jesus. Amen. But there's more good news. Jesus is a servant king, not a selfish king. In others focus. The most successful ministries are always others focus. The servant never asks the question, what am I going to get out of it? The servant cares more about what the other person is going to get. You ever go to a restaurant, look at the menu, Sister Glover, decide what you want, and when the waiter comes and you tell them, they say, no, this is what you ought to eat. Because <laughs> this is what I like. That makes sense? Hey, Amen. What, what, what does the one who's supposed to be serving you, Brother Kersey, look like telling you that you can't have what you've ordered? They prefer that you would have what they like. Amen. They're making it about themselves when their position is to satisfy and serve the customer. Amen. We can be like that in church. Oh, I got a better way than God. <laughs> Jesus is a servant king. Throughout the New Testament, we see over and over again how Jesus served others. One poignant scene in particular is when he washed his disciples' feet. Now, I tried to break it down, but it, I couldn't. I had to put the whole thing out there. When we look at John chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, listen to what the Bible says. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. How did he express it? Verse, verse two. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded, even Judas. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? You the man. You in charge. You the one we following, Jesus. 
answered and said unto him, What I do, thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Give me the full bath. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Who was he referring to? Judas, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and Lord, and ye say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master have washed your feet. Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, Happy are ye if you do. Yeah. This is what Jesus said. But the Apostle Paul shows a more profound portrait of Jesus' servant king. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. It starts with the mind who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, look with Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus everything should bow, the things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, oh God completely turned our natural ideas about power, authority, and privilege upside down. The world values ascending whatever success or popularity ladder there happens to be nearby, while Jesus values descending to serve the least of those among us. His descent from heaven to save and serve us is our greatest motivation and example to humble ourselves and to serve those around us. In the standard economy of a kingdom, kings are not servants and servants are not kings. Yet here is Jesus being both of them. Good God Almighty. We have an all powerful and almighty God who purifies us from our sin, not by sitting idly by, but rather exalting himself through becoming the servant king. That's good news. Amen. Amen. But there's more good news. We get to repent. Everybody don't get to do it. You get shot up or killed before you say, I repent. And if you don't repent, you in bad shape if you die. Because those sins are charged against you in judgment. Amen? We get to repent. That's, I try to live a life of repentance, Pat. Now, you, you probably the holiest woman you. 
<laughs> they got to spread uh, the rose petals everywhere you walk. It's just, you, you wear white, it, you know, it's just all. But I, I got a few stains. I, 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 I'm going to think something. Brother Kirk said, I'm going to say something. And Lord, going to do something that ain't in God's will. And I have to remember repentance. This, this, this is what we have to be real in the church. I know Florina is the most holy. Because she got this holy voice. <laughs> She's always calm. She don't cuss. She don't go off. She don't have no impure thoughts. You know. But that's for me and me and Fred. Now we, there are times then, with the Bible in our hand. Some thoughts are into our mind. Come on. Because we, we, as long as we're in Accept this about yourself. Amen. I promise it'll help you minister the gospel to others. We got to give the sinner something to identify with. And what people are tired of are these holier than thou personas that we put forth is if we've never done anything wrong and that since we've gotten saved that we all of a sudden the perfect Christians. No. We get to repent. And Jesus <laughs> made a way for us to repent because God knew even at our best we're still filthy rags. <laughs> Amen. That's what God said. And we can. So. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let, 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 let. Yeah, come on. Let us say it again in the mic so the people can hear. Because Donald Trump needs to stand and repent for that Bible he has in his hand. Yeah, that he's trying to sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, yeah. He, he's now trying to raise money, saying it's going to a nonprofit. He's, he's going to selling Bibles now, from selling gym shoes to selling Bibles. Because he needs the money. The same one who, when he was president, had the Bible upside down and referred to two Corinthians. As, <laughs> even he. If the Lord doesn't take him, he gets to repent. And I pray he does. And all of those who are part of this ungodly movement. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we, we, get, we get to repent. That's an amazing privilege. That unfortunately, a lot of those in the body of Christ don't take advantage of. We'll keep piling up and think like he, uh, I remember in one interview, he says he doesn't need to ask for forgiveness because he doesn't do anything wrong. That's the worst. That's the worst posture for any human to take. But there are people who are blinded and actually believe that. I, I, I want my relationship to be, uh, 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 Sister Moldy, that if I find myself going off the path I embrace, I welcome the Holy Spirit's conviction. Tell me, God, because there are some things we're accustomed to in the flesh that we won't believe it's wrong until we find it in the scripture or until it's preached or taught or until the Holy Spirit says, now you know, no, that, that's not what you should be doing. Come on, y'all, leave. Okay, let me make you feel comfortable. For all have seen so don't nobody feel like they're being picked on. It comes short of the glory of God. We get to repent. Jesus calls us to repent of building our own kingdom, which is good news because kingdom realignment is the best thing that could ever happen to us. Don't you want to know the right way? Yes. Amen. After living the wrong way for so long? <laughs> I do. Amen. Deacon Ellis, I used to think multiple women was the thing. <laughs> That's what I grew up around. That's what I saw my daddy, my uncles. Hey, Amen. My uncle would say even a car got a spare tire. <laughs> Learn behavior. And we practiced it. That's right. And enjoyed it. That's right. So y'all trying to act like it. Okay, y'all get on my nerves. Oh, it was just so horrible. Amen. 
but I'm gonna go back one more time. <laughs> Am I telling the truth, Sister Moten? Amen. <laughs> this is the last time, Sister Johnson. <laughs> Did you get a call? <laughs> what we say, Sister Glover? Oh, the, flesh, the spirit is willing, <laughs> but the flesh is weak. <laughs> Amen. Somebody well, said, thank God for weak. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and we don't feel bad until afterwards. Yeah. How come we don't feel bad leading up to it? So God knows this about us. He has been touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And the only difference between Jesus and us is that he was without sin. He was able to resist the temptation. He didn't fall. He didn't allow his flesh to lead him into sin. We don't have that, which is why we have to be disciple, disciplined. We've got to put this thing to practice so that we get better at it. Amen? Which also moves us to extend grace towards those who have fallen. Amen? We're just an opportunity away. Because if we don't think we'll get caught, nobody will see us. If we think, come on. If we think we, if we thought we can get away with it. So we have to be mindful. And take advantage of the redemptive work Jesus performed on the cross when we see. He's given us an opportunity to repent. Amen? He says, before moving to the practical nature of living on mission, we must first examine our hearts. Instead of living to pursue our own pleasure and attain our own glory, which is always fleeting, we get to be swept up in the greatest story that's ever been told and glorify the true and rightful King Jesus with our lives. He gives us news and better purpose, one that will never fade or fail us, even in eternity and even on Wednesday, chasing after his fame and glory instead of our own is the best trade we could ever make. The kingdom of God is a real kingdom, y'all. Not a sandcastle like our meager attempts. We are not only invited into God's kingdom, we are also invited to be part of spreading the good news. We get to plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 20 says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Amen. You know what an ambassador does? They represent the kingdom. They are United States ambassadors that are all over the world. And wherever they are, they represent the U.S. They have embassies, which means no matter where that place is in any country, that part is the United States. And as an ambassador, you have to represent the U.S. Well, we are kingdom citizens under a king and we have to, we as ambassadors, we have to represent the king. It says Second Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.20. What y'all do if I show up? What y'all do if I show up Easter Sunday with a Trump Bible? So we gonna do like <laughs> are you really? Yeah, Marjorie Taylor Gray, get him out of here. The Bible says we are, the, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his special appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The wayward this blesses my soul because I was once them. The wayward are not lost forever. King Jesus seeks and finds them. The traitors who chose treason or Trump over relationship are not hopeless after all. Jesus reconciles them to the Father. 
the prisoners and mourners are not left in their despair. King Jesus breaks down the chains of sin and grants freedom while giving comfort to the hurting. The poor and brokenhearted are not left by the wayside. King Jesus restores us through kindness and transforms us to be spiritually rich. Indeed, it is a kingdom of good news. But we only have the opportunity to spread this news and plead on his behalf when we practice kingdom realignment. When we leave behind our own kingdoms and pursue his. And this kingdom alignment leads us to a kingdom, or leads us to a kingdom mentality where as everyday missionaries, we are more concerned with the bigger picture of God's kingdom than we are with ourselves. Oh, this blessed me. We're left with a couple of questions before we end. And these two questions are this. Number one, in times past, have you seen your life realign with God's kingdom purposes? I believe we all have. Amen. Because we, we're not all we used to be. That, even if it's a little improvement, there have been some improvement. Amen, Deacon Walker. <laughs> Amen. Sister Johnson, you're a little better than before. Is it because somebody told us? Look at that. See, somebody, somebody told you, so they're witnessing. Those of you online, has that been? Do you see yourself? Amen. Are there things different about you? Are there changes in your life, legitimate changes that others can see? Amen. As your life aligns or realigns with God's purpose, answer me. I don't see nobody on this. Y'all ain't saying nothing on here. <laughs> Okay, my cousin, Gregory Ray. Now, that's my cousin. We grew up together. <laughs> Amen. Greg, no. Uh, his daddy, my uncle Leroy, and my father, brothers. We grew up around that. And if there's two people on this earth that are not all the way they used to be, it's me and cousin Greg. He was called the life. Speaking of life on mission, we call he was the life of the party. <laughs> He would tell us, I hope you don't mind, Greg, me telling the story. He said, I can get you in, but you got to buy your own drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And the second question is this. In what ways do you still need to surrender your kingdoms to him? There are some things we still struggle with. We still struggle releasing, letting go. Because they cater to the flesh. I've been trying, Sanji, to stay away from them sweets. <laughs> I've been too. Uh, 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 February 20th was the last Sunday I had candy. I ain't had no cakes, but I did have some peach cobbler when we went to that soldier. <laughs> and I snuck me a little ice cream in between. Because I realized, Henry, my best efforts, I... When you when you a candy a sweet you you had those withdrawals and headaches, attitudes, and the cure it. Come on, thank you, <laughs> thank you brother Kersey. and pound cake, amen. And so there are still things we and, and this is just a, one example. It could for alcohol, it could be a uh, sex for others, it can be. Uh, drugs, it can be uh, a shopping, a uh, credit card, I mean, uh, come on. Things that we know, uh-oh. Somebody pick Sister Johnson up off the floor back there. <laughs> These addictions that we are not yet ready to surrender because there's some type of pleasure that comes from engaging in these things. And so daily, as we live lives of repentance, we have to pray that God gives us strength to resist temptation. My daily prayer, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from all evil. Because the devil knows our weak points, we talk about them. He watches us participate in it. And he's going to keep it all, he's going to always have the opportunity before us. 
But if we submit ourselves unto God, resist the devil, he'll eventually flee. So this surrender part, we have to surrender our kingdoms and submit to his. And this is how we grow. This is how we get stronger. Amen. So celebrate the baby steps. It ain't a, ain't a super natural overnight uh, transformation. It can happen. It just ain't happen with me because I put up a fight in the areas where I still want to be satisfied. Am I by myself? No. Amen. So this lesson speaks to us as it relates to life on mission involves a, 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 a continued willingness to submit and surrender to his will. Nevertheless, Jesus had his challenge. You remember in the garden when he said, hey, hey, get this cup pass. Uh, you know, I'm starting to think about it. I don't want to do this. Nevertheless, let me get out of my field. It's not my will, but your will be done. And if we could practice that in our own lives, I'm not saying we're going to knock the ball out the park every time. I ain't going to even say we're going to get a base hit. But at least we try and we're getting better as we progress. Amen. Amen. Did the lesson bless anybody today? Amen. Amen. It bless me. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Listen, uh, <laughs> I love these teachings. And as God continues to pour into us and equip us uh, uh, to do his will for his glory, uh, I feel energized. In our year of momentum, I mean, God is just strategically aligning the teachings and messages to help us get to that place where we don't lose momentum and that we can uh, be the people of God that he's called us to be. Not perfect people. I'm grateful that his grace sees to it that ordinary people like you and I can be used in magnificent ways uh, uh, to bring others into the fold and to bring glory uh, to God ourselves, to, to God himself. So listen, if you're here, in your own line and you have not received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord of your life, I encourage you to repeat this prayer of salvation right where you are. It simply says this, Father God in heaven, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus is that Savior. I believe your son Jesus died, was buried, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. And because I believe in my heart, what I have just confessed with my mouth I thank you, Lord, that I am saved. Thank you for saving me from this world. Thank you for saving me from myself. And thank you for saving me from an eternity in hell. I give my life to you this day. And I thank you for receiving me into the family of faith. Now fill me with your spirit and use me to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you prayed that prayer with every bit of sincerity and expectation, we shout hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You are now saved. We welcome you to the family of faith. We welcome you to the kingdom. The angels in heaven rejoice over the one who repents, and we join heaven in celebrating your decision. Hallelujah. Now that you're saved, if you don't have a church home, whether you're a physical or virtual member or would like to be, the information is on the screen. Send us an email. Send this tape. As a matter of fact, copy this email and send it to people that you know ain't, ain't saved or church and tell them to get on board the Partakers Church train. Amen. Partakers Church at Outlook.com. We would lovingly welcome you into the family. I would be honored to serve as your pastor. There's no greater place to partakers. Connecting generations to Jesus is what we do. Amen. All right, all right. If this ministry or this lesson has been a blessing to you and the Lord has moved on your heart to sow or to give, the information is on the screen. If you're giving electronically, we have QR codes for Givelify and for Cash App. Amen. Then we encourage you uh, to sow again as the Holy Spirit leads you. His seed doesn't beg bread or beg for bread. Amen. Uh, we ask that you would give cheerfully because that's what the Bible requires. Amen. If you're, if you're using Zelle, the Zelle information is on the screen as well. And if you're sending it, 
or dropping it off at the physical location, uh, the address is on the screen as well. Amen. Let's pray, God. We thank you for the gift of the giver. We pray these gifts are acceptable to you for they are being given from cheerful hearts as you require. Now, please, God, in the name of Jesus, take these gifts, multiply these gifts, and that they be used for your kingdom and to your glory. And over and above the amount, bless the heart of the giver, is our prayer. In Jesus' name, let every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. All right. At this time, we encourage those of you who desire prayer, if you would type in your request in the chat area, amen, or in the comment section, and we will lift you all up in prayer. We will bring our faith together and petition heaven on your behalf as you petition heaven on our behalf. We pray for ourselves, one another, our family, friends, loved ones, lost ones, enemies, frenemies, amen. Whoever it is that requires prayer, this world, we're lifting up those in Baltimore, God, with that bridge collapsed and they're going through uh, the, the task of, uh, uh, they say it's still a, a search rescue mission, that there still may some pe be some people that are unaccounted for. And God, when those type of tragedies happen, it just pulls uh, uh, on our hearts. L literally, when anyone's hurting, it pulls on the heart of the church. And so we're praying God's immediate move in the lives of those who need them uh, according to his will. And so as we lift them up, we're lifting up uh, Brother Antonio Thomas in the loss of his brother, uh, Michael Thomas. We did get the, uh, 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 yeah, the arrangements, the funeral arrangements, um, which you can find on the partaker's private page, uh, the partaker's private page, amen, uh, uh, concerning the brother of... Uh, our own Antonio Thomas, Michael Thomas. We're lifting up Sister Carol Parham, the daughter of Sister Dorothy Wilson. We're still lifting up Sister Sarah Haynes, the entire Golden Girls Mother's Ministry. And of course, you, our brothers and sisters in Christ who are partakers. We're not limiting them to partakers, but we are being partial. We are partakers, church, and we pray for one another, but we're lifting you all up in prayers. Those of you, who are asking for prayer, amen. Uh, prayer request from Pastor John Davis, Iconium Baptist Church, James Coleman Sr., Trent Pitts, uh, Sister Lolita praying for the entire family, friends, neighbors, enemies, and all my father's children. Bonnie praying for Al Green, oh, I'm sorry, Alicia Green. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> it, it, it was, it, you know, on my on the thing, it was that part was covered up by the church logo. Amen. Like, I'll bring hallelujah. <laughs> uh, Sister Lee, Joyce Lee, <laughs> my husband, Anthony Lee, Kimberly Anderson, Renaya Johnson, Tony Howard, Adrian Marshall Colby, Henderson, Antoinette Johnson, Brenda Smith, my whole entire family, my church family, Pastor and First Lady, and me, Joyce Lee. Now, Sister Gwen, thank and praise God for how the Lord's recovering you. Deacon Reginald, lover man Ellis. No, I, I just added that. <laughs> he and his smile, Sister Gwen. Amen. Family, mom, Geneva, Denbo, unsaved and backslidden family members, friends, and you and young adults, pastor and Sister Winfrey, God bless you. Uh, Sister Winfrey said, pray for Al Green, too. <laughs> <laughs> Let me pray for singing. Amen. We pray for Pastor Al Green. Amen. Uh, to pray for my family and everyone. We're lifting up Hattie, Hattie Jeter, the entire family, Marcy and Derek Twig, Pat Smith, Derek and Williamson family. That's from Sister Mother Frida Wallace. Terry Dooms, uh, my brother Terrence, uh, Ronan E. Is that my blood brother is watching. God bless you, lifting you up in prayer. My cousin Greg, pray for me and my family as well. Got you all covered in prayer. Amen. Wanda Dalton, pray for Dalton and Dalton Green families. My loved ones in Jesus' name, Sister so Sharon Gilbert, Kenyon and Sharon Gilbert, Sandra Basil, Johnson family. 
Brother H. Sally is asking for prayer for his family, partake his family, and his enemies. Amen. Let us look to the Lord as we collectively bring our faith together. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, thankful and grateful that you hear us when we pray. God, as we come to you on behalf of ourselves, those who have tuned in, those who are in the building uh, with us, and those whose names we have called, typed, or that are circulating within our minds, hearts, and spirits, we thank you first and foremost that you hear us when we pray. We thank you for how far you brought us and how greatly you've kept us, even up until this very moment. And though God, uh, things may not be going as well as they could in the lives of certain people, but we are grateful that nevertheless, you are in control. Your sovereignty dictates all that goes on with each and every one of us. And we're just grateful to be part of your plan. Master, we ask for total forgiveness. We repent in the name of Jesus for any and all sins committed against thee and thee alone. We ask in the name of Jesus that you would create in us a clean heart and that you would renew in us a right spirit that we can continue doing your holy and most righteous will. God, hear the request of your people. Hear the cry of your children and the various needs and desires that we have that align with your will. And God, though there be too many to name individually, we're grateful that you already know what we have need of before we ask. But God, we ask that you would just touch this whole world. The songwriter says, tragedies are commonplace. All kinds of diseases, people are slipping away. The economy's down, people can't get enough pay. But as for we, all we can say is thank you, Lord, for all you've done. Thank you, God, for the things you've kept us from that were not in our best interest. Thank you for how you've kept us even when we didn't want to be kept. Thank you for how you've redeemed us and given us, put us on the right path, God. And thank you for the audacity of the gospel that it reached our hearts and changed and transformed our lives and that you are giving it to us through these series of studies that we may reach out and lead others to you. God, whatever disease, illness, sickness, ailment uh, that may be uh, hindering your people or touching your people, God, infirmities, remove it in the name of Jesus. Let your perfect hand of healing rest upon them and bring, to, bring them to wholeness, healing, and complete health. God, those who are recovering from procedures, God, heal them and bring them back into the fold in the name of Jesus. We pray uh, for the backslider, for those missing in action, God, in the name of Jesus, bring them back to the fold, God. We pray that you would keep your hand upon Partakers Church, Iconium Baptist Church, and those churches, God, that you have called uh, into being. God, you know what we all stand in need of. And as we combine our faith and send forth these prayers and petitions to your throne of grace, we are confident in your ability to not just hear, but to address our individual and collective needs. And God, if these prayers be too small, if you find our prayers being insufficient, we yield to say, nevertheless, not our will, but let your will be done. God, cover us and keep us. Bless those who are saved. Bless those who the word has touched. Bless the body of Christ overall. Keep your hand on this world, God. Keep things functioning as you would have to be. I know, God, I know that you gave us free will, but we don't always make the right free will choices. But God, I pray that you would extend your grace and mercy to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. And so God, as we close out this prayer, we close it with thanksgiving. Hallelujah, praise is unto you because we believe in the words of Deacon Evans, we know and we are convinced that you are God and besides you there is no other. So have your way with your people for your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Look, uh, we want to thank and praise God for each and every one of you who have told me this Friday is Good Friday. Hallelujah. 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 Hey, this Friday is Good Friday and we'll be having service at noon. Uh, Reverend Jimmy Leon Thorne will be our guest preacher. I'm asking every partaker that is a partaker that if you can join us in the building 
on Friday at noon. And if you can't make it, join us Friday online. This promises to be a wonderful worship experience. We will not uh, pull a Pharaoh. We will let God's people go and not hold you all day because there may be other things you want to do. But join us this Friday. And then after Friday, Resurrection Sunday is coming. Amen. I'm excited about what the Lord is going to prepare for us. Uh, Sunday school is at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Listen, parents, grandparents, great grandparents, uh, 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 uncles, aunts, uh, 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 guardians, bring your children. Uh, they'll be doing the uh, during the Sunday school hour. They'll be doing uh, the reenactment, uh, Amen, of the crucifixion, uh, Amen, and resurrection of Jesus. And so our children need to be there. And listen. After that, don't run out the door after you done seen your child get a speech. Stay for worship. Amen. It promises to be a wonderful time, and we will get you out of here in time enough to still have Easter brunch. So join us at either one or both in this case. Amen. We're looking forward to seeing you in the place. Amen. Also, help us spread the word about Partakers Church Baptist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram, X, and TikTok. It has been our pleasure to be with you. We pray that something was said or done that will draw you closer to Jesus and make you more of the missionary that God has called you to be. Until we meet again, partake us. Forever. Oh, yeah, well, peace. Have a powerful week, everybody. God bless you. See you Friday.